favored right now because we found two wonderful people who found the Lord, Dave and Loria Kalikia. They were both like Marilyn. They were raised in Jehovah's Witnesses, and they were set free. And simply by reading the Bible, and that is the New World Translation of that. They're going to tell you more about it. They have a big family, and it says 20 members here on this particular sheet of paper that we have on our program. 20 of their family members have disowned them. Dave and Laurie, would you come up here and share what the Lord has done in your life for us? Thank you, Ray. Well, we have uh, an interesting journey that we were on in our life we'd like to share with you. It was like being on a long trip, and uh, a very long trip. We were giving, given bad directions, it turns out. And you ever stop and ask directions again, and somebody tells you, you're way off. You're not even close. Well, that's what we found out when we started reading the Bible. So we'll go into a few more details. I'll let Lori start with her childhood. Well, I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. Um, in fact, I was one until about two and a half years ago. But I must say that the Witnesses influenced my family uh, long before they even became Witnesses. And this was because of my grandmother. She was an immigrant to this country, and she couldn't read or write very well. But they used to have tent meetings back then. And one day she just happened upon a tent meeting from Judge Rutherford, and she went in. And she was accepted and loved and warmly treated by all these people that loved the Bible. She had been raised a Catholic in Italy and really had no knowledge. So right away she got excited about it. She was one of those people that uh, picketed outside the churches with the signs, religion is a snare and a racket. Uh, she used to go to the door with a phonograph, and they didn't give sermons back then. And uh, I heard the stories how a lot of times the phonograph was thrown off the stoop along with her. And um, so she was very faithful. Um, my parents uh, and my sisters, they all lived in the same home with my grandma. Um, and they had a, a big piece of land in New York, and that was pretty close to the society, to Bethel. And so they used to, my grandmother used to let all the traveling overseers stay there, and the governing body used to come over. In fact, three of the members that are still on there used to come to my grandma's home every week for a study. So I'm, I'm telling you this to show you how involved she was. Um, all this time, though, she wasn't able to bring my family in. It wasn't until when she died, the year that I was born, that um, there was a change. My family was in grief. They were very, very close to my grandma, having lived with her all those years. And the witnesses really approach people when they're at their lowest, and they approached my family then. And of course, they were able to uh, comfort them with saying, you're going to see your grandmother and your mother again very soon. Uh, there's going to be a resurrection. Again, my family had been Catholics, raised, and had no knowledge of the Bible, and this is the first time they ever paid attention. That sounded wonderful to see my grandmother again. And so very quickly uh, they got excited, and also they were said, don't you want to at least learn what, you, what meant so much to your grandma? So they all came in. That was the year that I was born. So by the time I was two years old, they were full-fledged Jehovah's Witnesses. My three sisters were in their late teens. They all were pioneering. Um, one of my sisters went on to marry a pioneer and go in the circuit work in Canada. And my other sister um, married a Bethelite, and they went where the need was great in the Carolinas. Now, I was a little girl at the time, very impressionable, and I loved my sisters. I idolized them. So um, where, whenever I would be off from school, I would get to spend time with them in their assignments. At the same time, my mother and father were progressing along. Um, my father was a servant, and then he became the overseer. And as I said, we were close to Bethel. So this was a, another big influence. I mean, Bethelites, for anyone who's in New York, um, the Bethelites, uh, you're just so excited to have them in your congregation. They have so many wonderful things to tell you. And, here we were looking at uh, young men from all over the country who came to Bethel to um, serve Jehovah until Armageddon. I mean, they weren't paid for their work. They did it voluntarily. This was very 
in, this made a big impression on my life. I mean, between my sisters, my parents, and the Bethelites, we had missionaries live with us. Um, uh, two, one from Brazil and one from uh, Japan. They lived with us while they went to um, Gilead. In fact, two of the girls shared a room with me. So again, I looked up to all these people. Uh, This is how I wanted to spend my life. Um, By the time I was 11 years old, I was baptized, uh, and that was young, even then. But um, there was no question that this was the truth. Uh, You never think when you're involved with um, your whole family and with all your associations to question something uh, so concrete. You you would just never think about it. I never had a doubt that this was the truth. In fact, I used to feel sorry for the rest of the world. I mean, in school even. Uh, It was difficult maybe to take your stand, but I didn't look at it that way. I thought, well, what a shame these people don't know what I know, you know. So I really believed it. I was excited. And um, if it could get any more convincing to me, I guess it was probably the year 1966. And that was the year that... um, the date 1975 came out, right? Uh, yes, the Life Everlasting and Freedom of the Sons of God, I believe, was the book. Yes, that's right. Um, that was the book that they released with the first time we had ever heard a date. I mean, Armageddon was always right around the corner. I was just going to see my grandmother and all other relatives, and we were always waiting, waiting, but never a date. And I remember that assembly. I was uh, with my sister, who was in the circuit work, and her husband, and I went to Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, Brother Franz was given, n- not Ray Franz now, it was the other one, uh, the, the um, Fred yeah, Franz. Yes, Freddie. Yeah. <laughs> he gave the talk, and we were all waiting. Um, you used to wait until the, the, um, the governing body got on. That was the exciting part of the assembly for them to tell you what was new. Well, little did we know what he was going to tell us this year. Mm-hmm. And when he said that the, um, the end of the 6,000 years of mankind's existence would be in the year 1975. You could have heard a pin drop in that stadium, and it was full. I mean, I remember we were all so shocked. And he went a a step further, and like I said, it just stays out in my mind as if I was there yesterday. He said, brothers, he said, does this mean that by the year 1975 we will... Uh, the battle of Armageddon will occur and everybody was very quiet and his answer was could be could be I mean here we were listening to the president the vice president telling us it very well could be everybody was clapping they were all excited he went a step further he said brothers does this mean that by the year 1975 the battle will be already over and will be in the new earth and again his answer was could be brothers I remember people were crying at the end of that session. Um, We were hugging each other. I mean, we always knew it, but now we had nine years left. I had one sister that didn't marry a Jehovah's Witness um, because right when she was, the family came in, she had already met a young man, and he never became one, actually. But we went home from that assembly, and uh, we... We were all very excited. We practically got on our knees telling him he had nine years left. He had to get in the truth. We told him, this is unbelievable. We were so excited. Um, I was, um, I can't remember how old I was, 14, 15, something like that at the time. And so all the summers after that, I vacation pioneered. I had vacation pioneered before, but now it was very exciting. I mean, we had nine years left. Uh, A couple years later, they came out with a truth book. We only had six months to study with people. We couldn't waste any time. In fact, we weren't even supposed to stay at the doors very long, really. If people weren't interested, we'd wipe the dust off and go to the next one. I mean, we were trying to save souls. So, you know, we couldn't waste time. The the thing that struck me, too, was the Watchtower and Awake articles. Um, I still remember a big clock on the front of one of them with the minutes ticking away. And, I mean, we were this far away from the end. And you, you never considered, um, like, uh, we never considered education. That was, that was, I mean, who would care about education? Let, let me interject, too. Yes. The 60s was a perfect time to bring this up about the end because uh, on TV, between the race riots and the cities burning, you'd see every night, we had the Vietnam War going on. It was a lot of protesting. We had three major assassinations in the country. 
I mean, if the end was going to come, this was a perfect time to come. We didn't even have to wait till 75. It could have come in the 60s. So we were prepared for the end right then. We talked about how we would deal with it when, because we expected a great persecution before the end. So we were really on fire. This was, what bothers me now as I look back, is now that the society tells us that 1975 was something only um, in our minds, the witness minds, uh, that we got all excited. Where were we getting all this from? But we were getting it from all the assemblies, all the, the meetings, all the Watchtower and Awake publications, and they were getting us excited. And of course, at the time, we thought it was something to get very excited for. So I pioneered at that time, and I decided that if I did meet anybody to get married, um, I would want them to feel the same way, be excited about it, pioneer. And then in an assembly, we were doing rooming work in 1969. Um, I met Dave, and you can see where we are still now. But <laughs> okay, my story started in the um, summer of 59. Uh, the witnesses called at my mother's door. It was summer vacation. I was home. I had two younger brothers, six and three. I was nine years old. So, uh, and my father later became a witness about ten years later. And that particular year, uh, well, my mother, let me just say this. She grew up a Catholic. She didn't really learn anything there. I was, I guess, christened a Catholic. Uh, I remember going to the Methodist church as a child. They put me in Sunday school, but it was kind of like arts and crafts class. You know, we'd make tom-toms out of Hawaiian punch cans and stuff. I didn't really know too much about the Bible. I didn't know anything about the Bible, so I was a perfect candidate to be a witness. Um, even as a young child, academically, I can, you know, I like to learn things. And uh, so I'd sit in on the studies with my mother in uh, summer 59. And back then, the uh, thing was they'd come around with the booklets first, like the Good News of the Kingdom booklet, the Look, I'm Making All Things New. They'd, they'd go through a booklet with you, and then they'd go through the Paradise book or the Let God Be True book, whatever. And, um, you know, it was a great learning thing. My mother uh, said for the first time she was learning about God, learning about Jehovah, and we were being directed to the organization. So I was 10 years old. I was already able to go out and service uh, even without anybody with me. I didn't do that all the time, but I had times where I was alone. And uh, it was fun. You know, little kids, people get impressed. They, you place lots of magazines. It's a lot of fun. But um, I really believed it was the truth, even from a young age. And, um, you know, I had Christmas. I had birthday parties. I had all the holidays. And I had to give all that up. Uh, like all of you that have grown up as witnesses, it's a lot of peer pressure in school. Uh, not saluting the flag, not standing for the national anthem. Uh, I used to know some witness kids that would fake it, you know, come up halfway with the hand during the flag salute, but I used to, you know, make a fool out of myself, but um, I really believed it's the truth. The reason I say that, because a lot of times what happens is after you find Jesus and you come out of it, uh, relatives and friends who are still in the witnesses, they'll say, well, you never had it anyway. You know, you never really believed it. They forget about all the times you took your stand. But um, I really did believe it. Uh, I had to give up, you know, worldly friends and uh, all the other things that went with it. I hated giving up weekends. I know it's, it sounds like a minor point, but to a kid going to school, I mean, the weekends are great. You, you know, you, Sundays were bad enough because the next day was school. But here it was, Saturday morning, you'd get up, Go out in service, knocking on people's doors where I could be home watching the kids' shows. You know, they had the real good ones back then. And uh, knocking, and I'm talking industrial strength, house to house. None of this stuff that seemed to evolve over the past few years. You know, we make a call here, we drive over here, you know, get something to eat, 15 minutes, but, you know, make three calls in an hour. We're talking about doors right on top of each other, nonstop magazine work, which was real simple. Magazine work was nothing to it. Now, that was from 10 o'clock till noon. These are territories that were worked about every month. If it rained on Saturdays, Sundays. Then we had the book offer. You had to memorize the sermon with like three scriptures in it. It wasn't as much fun as magazine work because it was more complicated. And that's when you'd see most of the brothers. We had mostly sisters on Saturday. So I had to give up the weekends along with everything else. But in the Kingdom Hall... Uh, I was assisting brothers, you know, the magazine territory servant, the sound servant, whatever, whatever I could do. 
and uh, I took my stand in school. I didn't get baptized till I was 17. I was kind of late compared to a lot of the kids in the hall, especially those that had grown up in it. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, make this important decision. I didn't want to rush into it when I was a real little kid. So uh, I did it. I vacation pioneered uh, in high school, and uh, after I was baptized I, and graduated, I became a regular pioneer. Uh, then uh, conducted book studies, ministry school, different servants' positions, public talks, and um, I did this still while I was a teenager, so uh, I don't know. that Back then, I used to use a lot of teenagers in a lot of different capacities. Uh, again, I really believed what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this for my whole life. We did believe the end was near. As Laurie said about uh, in 1966, we had all these special awakes and all the special uh, things that they say never happened. I remember even the King of Ministry said about uh, so many months remaining. But we used to do it from the platform. You know, well, there's only a hundred and something months left, brothers. You know, we're getting close. And um, But we um, definitely stuck by what we believed, no matter how unpopular it was. At the time, we had uh, friends in our hall that were selling their homes, moving to where the need was greater. And, of course, I met Laurie in 1969 doing a rooming work for the uh, International Assembly that would be held in New York City. And um, we both had the same goals. So we wanted to move where the need was greater and pioneer after you know, we got married, which we did in 1970. So we went to Bethel and um, spoke to one of the brothers over there, I think Brother Adams, and uh, North Carolina was recommended. Because this was a big change from New York, going from five million people a square foot to, you know, nobody. They're beautiful people in North Carolina, um, but it was rough. I was untrained. Uh, I had to give up a college scholarship in school that I never really even tried for. I did very good on my SATs, and I was offered a scholarship. And like a good witness, I had to turn that down. So here I am, untrained, into the work world, part-timing it while I'm pioneering. So in North Carolina, I had groceries, I had paper routes, I had anything. I was making $38 a week, $8 for food. Because, you know, looking at us now, it's hard to believe we had $8 for food. But we were skinny. <laughs> we were skinny back then. In fact, we were so skinny we got sick. Lori got very sick. It was a struggle. And I got very, very discouraged. And after about 13 months, uh, we left North Carolina. We came down to Florida. I had never been out of New York until we moved to North Carolina. So she had relatives down here. She's telling me about Florida, you know, in the wintertime. The grass is green, it's warm, and all this stuff. I said, you know, we've got to get down here. I can't believe this because I'm freezing up there. So um, late 1971 is when we moved uh, to Florida. And uh, for the first time in my life, I was 21 then, uh, we would have, um, I would have a full-time job. I guess try to be a, a regular person, but with no training. And that's where we left off. Um, I was, I was going to say this was a change from our hope of doing it full time, but we never really lost the love for wanting to do it. But we just thought we'd do it in a more moderate fashion because we weren't well and had been going to the doctors and things like that. They said, well, so that didn't bother me. I still loved Jehovah very much and felt I could serve him in a normal life. Well, obviously, um, 1975 came while we were down here and um, nothing happened. But I was also, we had also had a two-year, we had a two-year-old daughter in 1975. And by, in fact, May of 1976, I was expecting my second child. So I was a little bit busy, um, more than as a teenager waiting every second. But it's not like I didn't notice it wasn't there. Uh, we never lost... Um, I want to interject yeah. again if I could. Um, back in the early 70s, too, we were really pulling at straws trying to make the end come. You know what I'm talking about. Something would happen in the news. Ah, this is it. This is it. This is it. The society was covered on all bases. Okay? We still believe, by the way, I, sometimes I sound a little bitter in my voice, but that's just now looking back. Back then, I really believed it was the truth. But they even said when they start calling for peace and security, they twisted that scripture around. So I remember when Nixon was running for re-election and Kissinger gets up there about Vietnam, you know, this is at end, you know, and everybody was saying, this is it, this is it, here's the peace. So it didn't matter. If there was wars breaking out, the end's near. If there was peace breaking out, the end's near. Everything was covered. They had it perfect. So, um, you know, you remember if you were there. So, as I was saying, we were sure. We never, never gave it a, a second thought. Um, as 
each year got um, away from 1975, as we got farther away from it, I will admit that I started getting a little worried. And I really was not worried about myself. I was still serving Jehovah in a normal life. I never questioned it or doubted it. But I was worried for my parents because they were getting older. I had been raised all my life believing that the generation that saw 1914 would be the generation that would see the end of the system of things. Now that meant someone who was old enough to understand the events in 1914. I mean, that was taught to every Jehovah's Witness as much, well, certainly more than the Bible. But I mean, that is how we based our whole thinking. That's what my parents hoped for when they first came into the organization. They were going to be there to welcome my grandmother back. This is what I heard all my life. So as it got progressively farther away from 1975, I was getting worried. My parents were getting older. Um, barring any accident or awful disease, I and they did expected to walk right through the, the new, into the new earth. Um, but by 1981, um, my worst fear came about and my father uh, died. I was um, totally unprepared for this. Um, I was very, very close to my dad, as my whole family was. Um, and any of you who've lost anybody that you love, uh, there's nothing worse than losing someone. I think um, it makes it worse to be a Jehovah's Witness that was taught that you won't lose them. Because, um, as Dave can testify, I probably reacted um, like a five-year-old to my father's death. I could get no comfort. The brothers and sisters came around after a couple of weeks people that I had known for 15 years came around and uh, I distinctly remember one of the elders and his wife saying, well, it's time to get on the stick, don't you think, Lori? Let's start getting back in the service, into the meetings. I mean, you're going to see him in the resurrection. Well, I didn't even know I could feel that way, but I was, I was full of rage. I turned to him and I said, I'm going to see him in the resurrection? He was supposed to be there to welcome the resurrected one. He died almost three score and ten, his lifetime. He died when his father died, when his mom died. It was not even supposed to be his generation. He was only born in 1913. And we were always saying the, uh, the phrase, millions now living will never die. Of course, we had no idea back then that they were saying that back in 1920, 1919, 1920, or whatever. So uh, we were applying it to our generation there. And so, like I said, I was, I was bitter when they said that. I didn't even know I would react that way, but that's not the kind of answer I needed, not someone who had thought differently. But then I composed myself and said, well, it's going to be a matter of months. I'll see him again. It'll be months. I read all the publications I could get my hands on on the New Earth. I could really find no comfort to just know that he was just non-existent. I couldn't deal with it. Um, about a month after he died, I used to be up till way into the morning hours. I didn't want my children to see how upset I was, and I would try to read and get comfort. And finally, one day, one night, I picked up the Bible. I had read everything there was, and I wasn't getting any answers. And I picked up the Bible. And I remember sitting there and just reading it probably for the first time, like a story. And I was in the Gospels. And Jesus' words about heaven just seemed to jump off the page at me. And I couldn't get over it. So every night, I picked it up and read some more. And he kept saying, whoever believes in me will never die at all. Um, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I mean, he didn't say, I'm going to prepare a place for 144,000. It just seemed so clear to me. It was, it was unbelievable. I, I was almost... Uh, not frightened by what I was finding, but it was unusual. I hadn't been raised in any other religion, so it's not like I was falling back to an old religious thinking. So I started showing Dave, and I started showing my sisters the scriptures. Now, they were all at a very low ebb, too, and they could see it, 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 what I was saying. I said, no, just read the chapter in context. Don't pick out the scripture like we used to read it. They saw it. But then right away, they clammed up and said, well, now look, Lori, what are you trying to say, that Daddy is in heaven? We know 
The funny thing about my dad is he was not your typical, even though he was an elder his whole, my whole life, until he died, um, he was not your typical witness. He used to spend an awful lot of time just talking about the Bible, always going off the outlines. The brothers were always having to tell him to get back in there. I remember um, all my life him teaching me to look at Jehovah as my father, and that's the only comfort I really had was that I could pray to Jehovah after my dad died. That was the only comfort except the Bible that I was finding now. But nobody would believe it. They said, look, Lori, that's not what you've been taught. You better just forget it. So unfortunately, I turned, um, shelved that idea about heaven. I didn't really forget it, but I didn't pursue it. And then I kind of turned it to real anger. Um, We had some real bad problems in our marriage because I couldn't handle the grief and I don't think Dave was ready to handle someone who couldn't handle the grief <laughs> that much so that was about a year and a half that we were I was really bad and um, then Dave came up with an idea he said why don't we just start fresh in a brand new kingdom hall and I thought well good these elders haven't really helped me um, they haven't been comforting let's start over somewhere else and we did But the funny thing is I sat in the kingdom hall again, kind of half-heartedly, and they started getting up there and saying the same things I had heard for 30 years. And I was looking at them and looking around at all these other old people. And I thought, you're all going to die too, and you're sitting there believing this, and your family's going to suffer. I was just getting angry again. So rather than stop Dave, I mean, I didn't want to be, you know, stopping the rest of my family from going, I started reading the Bible during the meetings again. I just tuned off the talk, tuned off the watchtower, and started reading the Bible. And I saw it again. It was about heaven. Jesus was promising it everywhere. He, spoke, he said that Abraham was there. And I'm going, look at this. Then Dave was getting kind of excited, and he was reading the Bible instead of listening. And he was finding more scriptures in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians. And we were just getting really excited. What was going on here? We really didn't know. But then he started doing something else on his own, and I had no part of this, but this was probably the, the main thing that, that really pushed us right out. Well, the hall I grew up in uh, back in New York was uh, an old hall. You know, the old halls got the old literature. The new ones don't anymore. Um, and this was an old hall that we started over at. So I told Laurie, well, maybe I can be more spiritual. I'll take home a book. You know, it is a library. I'll take home a, you know, a book a week. I remember thumbing through the books when I was a little kid, the older books. They were kind of boring to me. The illustrations were funny, but, the, you know, they were boring. Little did I know there was a couple of blockbusters in those books. Well, the first book I, I take out, uh, and if you read it, you know what I mean, was a blockbuster. It was The Harp of God. And uh, this is after the meeting. We had a morning meeting. So I'm I'm laying down reading this book, right? And for the first time, I start seeing the dates, right? 1799, 1874, all the dates, right? So it's like I was in the twilight zone. You know, I'm looking at this book. I said, Lori, this is is not even like our religion here. What is this? I never heard this before. You know, I thought I knew the whole history of the society. When I was a little kid, we came in. We had Jehovah's Witnesses and the Divine Purpose, which I thought was an accurate history. Then I think it was 75-year book or 76. I get a little confused there. But they went over their history again. I thought I knew it all, right? Now we come up with this stuff. Wait a minute now. What, what's all the stuff with the dates? And that started my mind thinking about a lot of different things. And there were some parts in that book where I thought were hilarious. I was rolling around laughing because you have to understand the book was written uh, in the early part of the century, what, 1921 or something, somewhere like that, early part. Anyway, um, it was talking about the early inventions, you know, what was considered big technology back then, and, uh, you know, how close we are to the end because of, you know, and I can't remember the exact things, but to the, the effect radio. of, could it be like the radio, the electric toaster, you know, stupid things like that, right? And it lists about 12 different inventions that shows that we're at the time of the end, you know? So I'm laughing my head off at this, right? But deep down, I know that something's definitely wrong here. And I'm reading more, more and more books I'm taking out. I'm finding out about dates and stuff. I took one book out, Government, which was a boring book except for one particular chapter. I thought it was pretty funny. It was describing the new system of things. Now, you know, as witnesses, we used to like to speculate, you know, what's it going to be like? You know, we'd be going out in service, you know, with the, the older brother you work. Well, I'm going to have that house in the new world, you know. I'm going to get that house right there, you know. Right? So anyway, but this was even better. This was coming right from the society. 
It was describing the new system of things, what it would be like. And um, it had these big highways, right? Big highways with the cars would be on. Or, and uh, outside of them, there'd be lanes for trucks. And outside of them, there'd be lanes for pedestrians, you know? And it was this year, April 15th, right? So you appreciate this. In a new system of things, according to the society, there would be low taxes. You know, you didn't know that, did you? Because <laughs> I wonder, you wouldn't be paying it to the IRS, I'm sure. I'd be going to uh, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. But there would be low taxes, according to that book, Government, and New System of Things. So it's revelations like that that were, you know, blowing my mind. Then I was, I knew right away, hey, <laughs> there's only maybe a couple chances this is God's organization. You know, slim and none. And slim just left town. <laughs> so it started me thinking about a lot of different things. Um, and I thought, you know, you know who Rodney Dangerfield is, you know? You know, no respect, you know? No respect. We were in a Rodney Dangerfield religion. First of all, we were second class. We got no respect in the world. We couldn't do anything. And in our own religion, we were second class. Well, the Bible's not for you. It's for the anointed ones. See, you're reading stuff about Jesus, you know, heaven. It, oh, that doesn't apply to you. We're a second class everything. And, and, and even they picked... A, a Rodney Dangerfield type of organization, the United Nations. Nobody listens to the UN, but the Watchtower made it the eighth world power. It never dawned on me. You know, we're reading this all these years. You accept it. You know, you're a little kid. You don't, you don't question your parents. But everything was second class. It was like we were morphed from the planet Orc. We, we were in, not in a real, a real world. You know what I mean? So um, my eyes became opened, and I said, this is a fraud. And, and then they'd come and bug you on Saturday. You know, you're trying to work in a yard, and they're coming by. You know, here they come again. You know, oh, we haven't seen you at the hall. All stuff. So finally, I uh, wrote my letter uh, in April of 84, resigning. I didn't make it a long letter, which is uncharacteristic of me, but it was only about a couple of sentences. And um, I resigned. Uh, I told them not to waste your time or my time, but I, I don't want to be associated with the... Uh, uh, witnesses or the religion, you know, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And it didn't give a reason, so they had no idea. But it was basically from um, what we've, we found in the Bible, we saw so much hypocrisy, and basically from their old publications. Uh, and I knew, even as a believing witness before that time, that if I questioned it, that they're, gonna, they're not going to answer my question. Goes, okay, where did you find that out? You know, who told you that? And there was a little talk about apostasy at that time, too, in the Watchtower. Uh, even though we weren't really paying attention to the Watchtower much at the Kingdom Hall anymore, we scanned it and we knew about what happened in Bethel. So we knew that we were in dangerous ground. Um, in fact, I read everything that Dave read. And coupled with what I found from the Bible, intellectually, I knew it was wrong. My mind knew that this was not the right thing to do. But I had such an emotional tie to the society that it's very hard to explain, except to some of others of you, that it took a long time to get out. I really feel that it took from my father's death until two and a half years ago, and he died in 1981. It took me all that time to break the hold. Um, so when Dave wrote his letter, I continued to go. I felt actually like a hypocrite, but I was going on the slim chance that they had just made a lot of mistakes, and it was still um, God's organization. It was like my family. To turn on them would be like turning on your family, which I would find out later my family could do to me, but I couldn't do it. It was an awkward time because the minute Dave did that, um, well, you told your family, and they lived in Georgia, so there was really no problem. They said, we still love you, and we'll talk to you on the phone and write you. So that was okay. It was going to be my family who lived across the street. My mom lived across the street. My sister lived across from her. So I'm within talking distance. I have seen them probably every day of my life since I moved here 17 years ago. Very, I thought, was a very close family. Well, once Dave did this, uh, my mother could no longer eat in my home. I used to feed her uh, dinner with us every week if, since my father died. She could no longer come to the house, and nobody could come to my house anymore. Well, I was getting upset. Now, I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't expect them to do it to me, not my family. I thought, well, other people will do it. They'll just forget it. And they kept saying, well, why did Dave have to do that? And I said, because of what he found out. Okay. I, Can I yeah. say something? 
We always interrupt each other. You know, we thought we were going to be fighting over this mic before we came. Um, as a witness, growing up, I remember we used to tell people, you know, always lead them to the organization, but if you belong to a church, we don't care if you didn't attend for 20 years, you've got to let them know where you stand. So I figured what was good enough for the goose, good enough for the gander. That's why I decided, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to beat around the bush, uh, and, you know, all the cliches and everything that go with that. But I made it sure that they knew exactly where I stood, and uh, that's why, another reason I wrote Well, I, as I said, I continued to go to the meeting, all the while making, unfortunately, snide remarks about the society to my family. When I say unfortunately, it wasn't until I learned really how Jesus showed love that I could have done it so much better, but I didn't. Um, I kept saying, bringing up all the things I had read out of the books, and one thing led to another, but I was still going. I was hanging on. It wasn't until um, my brother-in-law in Pennsylvania, now the one who was in circuit work in Canada, um, Ted Schreier, actually, it doesn't matter if he... <laughs> Here's his paper... It doesn't matter anyway, but um, <laughs> when you hear what he said about my husband, you'll understand. Uh, we were having a family discussion, and they were telling me, you know, Dave is an apostate. Uh, this is typical of apostates. They turn on the organization. You must not talk to him about it. And this is ridiculous. You live in the same house with someone. You're not supposed to talk about it. Besides, I wanted to talk about it because I was really leading a double life, which wasn't right. I just couldn't come to terms with it. The final thing was when my brother-in-law said to me, he says, you know, he's going to die soon. I said, what? They said, he's going to die. They didn't even bother calling him Dave anymore. I mean, he was worse than dirt. Now, this is somebody that I've been married to. For, it'll be 18 years this summer. I said, what do you mean he's going to die soon? And he just went, he is. Um, he's right up now up at the Bethel farm working. This is the kind of man I just want you to get a little indication of what's happening in the society now. Um, my sister looked puzzled, and she turned to him and she said, uh, what do you mean, Ted? You mean he's going to die at Armageddon, right? And he said, no, he'll die before then. So now there was silence in the room because we're all looking, knowing, even my sisters that are well in the organization, knowing he's, he's getting off on a tangent. This isn't society doctrine. And she says, well, where's that scripture, Ted, that says he's going to die? He said, I don't need a scripture. He said, Jehovah's not going to live that, let that kind live. And I looked at him, and if there was one slight doubt in my mind, I said, and I shook my head visibly, and I said to my other sister, I said, if they, they were trying to bring me in. That was the whole idea of this big family meeting. I had my 14 family members that are now not speaking with me against me, and they were trying to help me. Well, that was the final remark he ended it with. And, of course, a hug how much he loved me after that statement, you know. And I remember my father always saying, boy, how can you love somebody if you hate their own? So it was all going through my mind, and I thought, this is wrong. So I went to one or two other meetings because my children were really involved in it. We had raised them since they were born. They also didn't took their stand at school and everything. So it was very hard to all of a sudden say to them, I didn't know how to say to them, this is wrong, we're not going. I didn't know what was right. I just knew this was wrong. So one day I went to a circuit assembly in the fall, was it 85? The fall of 85? Uh, I think yeah, it I think was, yeah. It was in the fall of 85 and I had had it just up to here. I saw people that I knew had done terrible things, immoral things and bad things in business being presented on an assembly platform as fine examples of Christians because they were now pioneering. Well, that was you know, uncoupled with what my brother-in-law said about my husband, I got out of that assembly and I never went back. And this was hard for me to do at this particular time. I'll tell you why. Because my daughter, my youngest daughter, at, also in the fall of 1985, um, was, they told me that she had um, a problem with her kidneys. We took her for a routine exam and uh, she was looking healthy and wonderful and fine. And they discovered something, and they said, we have problems here. So I was taking her back and forth to the doctors at the time, and I thought to myself, what am I burdening myself with this falsehood when my energy should be 
towards my daughter. And I just gave up on that and I put everything into this. And any of you parents out there that have children, you know that when something is the matter with your children, nothing else really matters. So I was just concerned with that. But when I stopped going, then Dave um, felt that the children should stop going. And so he was kind of strong on that issue. And Around uh, New Year's Day, January, let me get in here, <laughs> January of 86, uh, Lori wasn't going anymore. I obviously wasn't going for a while. Um, but their grandmother, their aunts, you know, would take them along every now and then. And I said, look, I don't want you guys to grow up with the the same life we had, you know, with no opportunities, uh, all the hardships. We we're breaking our backs just to put, it, you know, food on the table. So I said, um, from now on, I don't want you going to the uh, Kingdom Hall. You know, no exceptions to the rule. So my oldest daughter got uh, real upset, started crying. She says, look, can't, uh, can't we read the Bible on our own as a family? So I thought about it. I said, yeah, we could do that. You know, we can. Uh, we had no problem, even though our understanding of the Bible was warped. I mean, I had no problem doing verse by verse with, through the whole Bible. So I figured, yeah, all right, it's not going to hurt, no problem. Let's start today. It was a Sunday, and uh, we started, and we still kept keep it up to this day. But from that first study, and this is used in the New World Translation, our eyes started being opened. Now we thought, you know. Somebody asked a witness, well, how many times have you read the Bible? Well, you know, millions of times we read it through. We didn't really read it through. We would uh, be assign, assigned a certain number of scriptures to read. And then according to society outline, they'd pick out the important parts. We used to breeze over some really good scriptures. Well, now we're going to hit everything with an open mind. And I still did not get into prayer at that time because I, was, I still felt there was, you know, no one's going to really answer you know, look at all those years as a witness where our prayers weren't answered. We used to pray for the end to come and never did. So um, well, we started. We started in the gospel account with John. And it was almost as if we were living the story with Jesus. It was unreal. We were just right there with him. I mean, we cried at the sad parts and everything. And um, we, well, let me, okay. well, we, a lot of things we found out right at the beginning. We saw definitely Jesus spoke about heaven. We saw how much time he spent on what he talked about. Things that uh, for years we used to believe a certain way. We found, you know, where it says about the little flock and the other sheep. You know, reading it in this context, we didn't have to have anyone tell us what a little flock referred to the Jews. The other sheep would be the Gentiles later on. It just made sense. It was the Holy Spirit working on us. And that was another thing. The Holy Spirit became a person to us. We saw in a couple of places in the New World where they slipped and they put he instead of it. You know, they forgot. And, hey, this is a real person, you know. And then we start asking the Holy Spirit, you know, we know he can help us. But I was going to say at this time, too, um, this was a real comfort on Sundays to do this. Because when you leave the society, as everybody who doesn't know um, the truth and know how to approach God, will say there's a tremendous emptiness. And even though it was only about a month and a half from when I left to when we started studying, I felt very alone and depressed. Um, I still would pray because I found my comfort in prayer. In fact, when my dad was sick before he died, um, I prayed, uh, broke all witness rules and prayed. And um, so I think that was to teach me that you can pray in adversity. Um, But at this time, while we were reading the scriptures, my daughter, um, this condition was worsening. She, um, in January, they told me that she had to go down and have a biopsy of her kidneys. Now, she was only nine years old, and I just really, to tell you the truth, wanted to just crawl in a hole. Uh, I wasn't prepared for it. As again, I said, I was raised as a witness. I wasn't prepared for any normal problems of life. Everything was supposed to be erased by Armageddon in 75, so I was a mess. The only time I enjoyed it was when we read the Bible. And... The con- uh, both of us felt that the condition, when they took the biopsy, they would find there was nothing wrong because it just had to be. She was my little girl, and she was healthy and fine, and that was what they were going to find. Uh, but they didn't. Uh, they found that uh, it was the beginning of a, a, a disease process. And so this was um, almost unbearable, really. Uh, my family 
was still very comforting to me through all this. Um, my one sister that I'm really blessed to have, the one that isn't shunning me and never has stuck through me through thick and thin at this time of my life, came with us down to the hospital, to the doctors. We were going every three weeks to the doctors. And I was really just so depressed. Nothing ever could get me out of the mood of being depressed except on Sundays. And then at night I would sometimes like read ahead. And David would say, oh, don't get ahead of the study. And I said, well, I need to read. I, I, need, I need the comfort from it. But um, we, like Dave said, it started getting alive to us. And Jesus' life started getting alive and the miracles that he did. And um, I always loved to talk about Jesus. When I was little, my father spent a lot of time talking about him. I remember at the memorial time, he would those three days, he'd always say, Now remember, Jesus died today. Just think of what he gave. So, I mean, his life was real to me a little bit as a witness. And I think that was the saving thing. But then it got really real, didn't it? Uh, especially his miracles. And I remember one particular study. Well, we read that the woman who um, was in the crowd and just touched Jesus' coat and he felt the power leave him and he turned to her and he said, your faith has made you well. And I thought, that's it. Yeah, it's her faith that made it well. He didn't turn around and say, you are cured. The faith that she had, he knew she had it. And it wasn't just the act of touching him, because people were touching him all the time. <coughs> and not necessarily getting healed. People were grabbing his coat, touching him all the time. But it was her faith. And, and a week before, we had read in the scripture that if you had the faith of a grain of mustard, that you could move mountains. And that was always very special to me, too. I thought, well... I really believe that Jesus, I know he did it when he was on the earth, and he's a, a king in heaven. We didn't really understand how much power Jesus had, but we could see that he had much more power than we ever gave him credit for. That coupled with a scripture that Dave found later in the afternoon on. Right, this is what really got me going into prayer, because uh, we happen to be reading a, a passage in the Gospel accounts where it said, if, if two people agree on something, and, you know, here, Lori was praying, I wasn't, and uh, we, we read that scripture, and if, uh, that Jesus would do it. And he Jesus, said, in my name, yes. again, something so very we, different. We would witnesses. alter our prayers a little bit. And we're not talking about using, like we did as witnesses, you know, Jesus is a password at the end of the prayer. We were actually getting heavy into Jesus. And um, uh, that, uh, she, Lori told me, she says, will you pray? Will you pray about Gina's condition? Uh, in this because way. I just knew that the same Jesus that was there doing that on earth, all those things, I just knew what I felt it. And I, I, I can't even put it into words except to say that I felt that he is the same and he can do the same miraculous things. And one night, um, after reading the scriptures, those scriptures, we both prayed. It was a Sunday night after our study. And I'm going to tell you, I could be talking to another group of people that wouldn't believe me, but... The very next morning, uh, we woke up, and I'll tell you, I, to be honest, I even forgot. You know how you wake up in the morning? I forgot that I had prayed that. And I, there was a very obvious way. Someday, if you all have another three or four hours, I'll tell you in detail. But there was an obvious way that I could see immediately that there was a tremendous improvement in my daughter's condition. And I went running into Dave, and I said, you're not going to believe it. Something's changed. And he looked at me and he thought, you know, I would snap if this wasn't really. And he says, well, Lori, I don't know. Don't, get, don't go crazy now. Maybe it's a mistake. I said, don't you even say it. Don't you dare even say it. And he says, all right, I won't. Because this is very new to us. As witnesses, we were afraid to ask the specifics. We very carefully always said, if it be your will, um, if it's by what is good for your organization, we never really spoke to the Lord and asked him anything. To say... What happened that day was the beginning of a wonderful change. It's been two years now, and from that moment that we prayed that very next morning, two weeks later I took my daughter to the doctor, and I told them before they could even do the test that they would see an improvement. And they could see, I was beaming, they said, what have you done? Well, what they told me about this condition I would like to explain is that there was no medicine. She was on no medicine, there was no treatment. It was a progressive problem. 
They had seen people occasionally stay the same for a little while, but hers seemed to be getting worse each time we took her. I could see the improvement. The doctor came back in about a half an hour, and he said to me, you were right. He said, I see an improvement. Now, I wasn't surprised. I knew it. I was beaming, and I said, you're probably not going to believe this. I said, but I prayed, and this is an answer to prayer. And you know what he said? And all the doctors down there, it's in the University of Miami, um, pediatric kidney department. They, he said, I've seen miracles in my day. He said, who do you think directs these hands? And I just, I was so excited that he said that. You know, I mean, here a former Jehovah's Witness when nobody ever talks about these things. I was like, oh. So my sister, the one who was stuck with me, she's sick and thin, was there and heard that and has seen this progress. I, of course, ran to my other sister who was still speaking to me. And we told your parents, remember, you can tell about that. But they were happy that she was better. But when I went on to explain how I, what we did, their faces hardened, if I must use the expression, and they said, you didn't pray to Jesus, I hope. And I, um, now I'll tell you, my religious training as a witness uh, still came through because I said, well, I was very careful. And I was. <laughs> we laugh about it now. <laughs> I was very careful. I asked Jehovah if I might please speak to Jesus, which <laughs> it's true. I did. <laughs> right? Didn't we? We both did. We agreed that's how we do it so we wouldn't offend because we were so told not to do that that I was afraid we would offend, offend Jehovah and he wouldn't listen and Jesus would be offended and I just didn't want to offend anyone. So when I explained that, they still had a very strange look. And then they said, well, why should your prayers be answered? My one sister said, my husband died. My prayers weren't answered. People are dying all the time. People are sick. I'm happy, but why, why you? You of all people because I hadn't gone to the meetings. I wasn't doing anything right. And I said, well, I'll tell you why, because I believed it. I said, the Bible said you just have to have faith. I said, and it's real. He will do it. Well, I, they were starting to look at me with a look that I had never seen in all my years of my family. And that started kind of like the gap <clears throat> that led up to where we are now. Dave's family was very excited, and they reacted similar to didn't they? Similar, very similar. Family. Like, oh, really? Uh, who told you to do that? You know, so they were happy. Um, I will say about my daughter's condition, I must say one more thing. We went down again for another, we were going down every three weeks. Uh, this was two years ago. Um, the next time I went down, I was still very, very excited, and I told the doctor that this was just going to keep going until it was the way, just the way it came. That's just the way I knew it. Uh, I, Jesus was just going to make it just go back the way it was. And so he said to me, um, well, he said, uh, this was another doctor. He said, I believe in miracles too. He says, but I don't want you to go crazy now, he said. And then he gave me all the statistics again. And I, all I needed to do was to look around at all the other children that were being brought there. And I could see what he was trying to say. I understood why he said it. There were a lot of other mothers there and a lot of very sick children. So I... Um, went home. I didn't get the results. They did hundreds of dollars worth of blood tests every time we went down. Two days later, I got a telephone call from Dr. Z. We called him Dr. Z. We couldn't pronounce his Cuban name, <laughs> so everybody called him Dr. Z. Anyway, he called me. He called me on Friday, and he said, I just wanted to call you, he said, because you were so excited in my office, and you had so much faith that this was going to uh, change. He said, um, I would have been very, very happy if the condition had stayed the same as it was the first time I took her back three weeks ago. He said, I've never seen it happen in my practice. He said, but this has not just stayed the same, it's starting to get better. He had seen all the, this chart, you know, all the things were, and I just said, well, I knew it. And of course, I was getting more and more excited and just more happy about the Bible. I was speaking more about it to my family. And... We both decided that um, we wanted to live a total normal life. We didn't want to deprive the children of the normal things, that we were still uh, half witnesses in some of our thinking. And so we decided, I don't know how any of you feel uh, here, and I don't want to push my particular feelings on anybody, but we decided that holidays and things like that were condemned by the watchtower alone. We couldn't find it in the Bible. 
and we were going to be normal people. Well, I think that was it for my family. <laughs> that was it. Um, I never told them. Out of respect, I never rubbed it in their noses and went and said, now, like, running down the street in a Santa suit. I didn't do it. I just... No, I mean, literally, because if you saw how they acted, you would think that's what I did. I was very low-key. In fact, Dave dragged the tree in the back, practically. I mean, nobody... And, and they would blame him anyway. But that was it with my family, um, especially my sister up in Pennsylvania. She couldn't deal with it. She said, uh, Lori is an apostate, and Satan is in her mind. And so my close family that I love and still do very much. Um, uh, not only my two sisters and their husbands, uh, I grew up with them as I told you, but all their children and um, being the youngest, I kind of grew up with my nephews and nieces. I'm only about five years older than them, so they're like brothers to me. They all cut me off also and uh, all their this, children. This, this wasn't official by the Kingdom Hall or the Society. It's just her family decided to... Uh, My to family, be because they knew how I felt about the Bible, about heaven and Jesus. And then this was the final straw. And I heard later through the grapevine, which is my dear mother, who still speaks to me in spite of it all. She's going to be 75 this year. And she's a wonderful person and a balanced Jehovah's Witness, which gives me a lot of hope, because my dad was a balanced Jehovah's Witness which means he went with his gut feelings, which was right in a lot of cases, different from the society. So she'll still speak with me. But this was very hard for me to bear when my family did this to me. And even though I had a lot to be thankful for with my daughter and with the Bible that I had found so many truths, this was very hard. And um, so then in, was it 87? Yeah, last year in January... Uh, they all stopped speaking with me totally. And I reacted in my typical <laughs> excited sense. I didn't just sit there and take this from my family. <laughs> they couldn't do this to me. I was, you know, upset. I wasn't going to let them just stop speaking to me. It was ridiculous. So I started writing them letters. I mean, they wouldn't speak. I waved and they walked away. I, I lived across the street. I yelled something and they'd run in the house. I, I felt like running over there. I was afraid they'd throw me out. The thing, the thing that was annoying, too, where Lori felt she had to say something was because several of the family members were sneakily, sneakily celebrating holidays, you know, going to Christmas parties. Well, this is my nephew. So that never celebrating went various different holidays, and yet that's okay. And uh, but we were the bad guys. Well, so we because they <laughs> really believed it was the truth, they just weren't good enough to live up to the standards. But I had defied that in saying it wasn't the truth, and so that's where the difference. And we took place. So I tried writing them letters. I, they all had answering machines. I think they kind of got the answering machines after I got out. <laughs> they wouldn't have to listen to me because they knew I wouldn't sit still for it. So I would call and keep putting messages on their machine. I mean, one time I had a half-hour message. I kept ringing back every five minutes. They, <laughs> I had a new message on there, you know, saying, I'm not an apostate. I said, if you read your Bible, just open your Bible, you'll see an apostate in the true sense, as Ray said, is someone who turns away from the message of Jesus. I said, all I have is left an organization. And then I said, which I know was nasty at the time, but <laughs> I said, um, if we're going to go with everybody who leaves a religion as an apostate, then Jehovah's Witnesses are made up of all apostates because they all came out of other religions. So you're just a bunch of apostates yourself. How, you know, I was... <laughs> I was um, a little bit nasty and, and, you know, but it was right what I was saying. It's just the wrong method, I think. Definitely, I know it was the wrong method. I didn't get anywhere with anybody. And um, then we decided through my, well, Dave will probably tell you this. We decided, to, I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't know there were any other ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, and I couldn't cope with losing my family. This was just too much. So one day we decided um, to call um, the famous, <laughs> hate to say that, didn't you? The famous apostates of our area, which was a big step, Ray and Marilyn Marsh. <laughs> I, th I think this whole thing started because uh, Lori's mother told her, you know, why don't why don't you hang out with your own kind? You know, which sounds like something from Noah's Ark, you know, your own kind. You know, what are you talking about? <laughs> but it was, you know, she says, you know, the apostates. And I got very indignant when she said there, that. There was no hint. I mean, we never mentioned the anybody's name we never you know we didn't do that but they all assume 
that they know what the apostates are doing. I don't know, maybe they have witnesses that monitor different assemblies such as this, and they, oh, we got a new thought here, this is what the apostates are doing now. So anyway, she says, why don't you hang out with, you know, your own kind? So Lori thought, all right, we'll call Ray and Marilyn. Now, we, did, we knew them from, you know, we've seen them in assemblies and halls, they were nice people we knew, but, you know, we didn't picture them, you know, to be, you know, real religious people necessarily. We figured, no, they were nice people. So I told Lori, look, I said, I still, even though we believed in prayer, we believed in Jesus, we knew the society was wrong, but I still had it up to here with religion. You know, I didn't want to get into no more religious discussions or whatever. So I said, I know, we'll just talk with them on how they cope, you know, with being ex-witnesses. We're not going to bring up any religion. I don't want to talk about no religious stuff. Well, too, because I called Marilyn and I was so shocked that she was talking about the Bible. I, I really don't know what I expected her to be. But, you know, it was exciting to find that she was reading the Bible, too. But then she mentioned a few doctrines, and being my typical, you know, witness self or ex-witness self, I clammed right up and I thought, hmm, I don't know. And I told David, I don't know, they have different doctrines, I don't know if we should see them. But he said, let's go. And we did. And that well, What happened night, was, we had a little a marathon session, right? We hours <laughs> of the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock, whatever. And um, it was fantastic. We, we, we talked about everything. When we left... It was almost like we talked about too much, you know. I, I thought, is there is there anything we didn't believe? That, I mean, that, that was that was uh, you know, w was there anything that was correct that we believed? We went through all the different doctrines. Anyway, uh, here we are now, and uh, we're just glad to be here. Um, when we pray, and every day we pray for our family members and friends that we knew as witnesses that are still in the cults. Um, we pray for no matter whatever method it is for them to find Jesus, because he's there, knocking. All they have to do is open the door. Um, we found with us it was just a matter of reading the Bible. So that's sometimes we pray about that. It might be someone's personality or something someone says, someone that can work a little better. We tried with our families. It didn't work. Well, maybe someone where they live can try. Maybe they'll have a run-in with someone at the Kingdom Hall, and it'll say, hey, these are all hypocrites. But we keep praying. We don't stop praying. And uh, we keep it positive. And I was going to say, from when we met Ray and Marilyn, not met, re-met them as Christian people, and then we went on to meet Sonia and Lauren Hintz and Bob and Paul, Paula Giaquino, and it was like, for the first time, I was getting my family back. I, it reminded me of Jesus' words when he said, you will lose mother and father and sister and brother, and I will give them back. And my, uh, my one sister that sticks by me, she said, Laura, you're being blessed because I was so sad. I had, I had no friends in the society. All I had was my family. And I didn't really want worldly people <laughs> I didn't know, to be my friends. And I had met such wonderful people, and I was so excited. And they welcomed me into their home, and they encouraged me with their faith because they were Christians and encouraged us along and led us to where we are today, all of them. Uh, we found out about the other ministries, and I want to end on a very positive note about prayer, especially to some people that are having problems right now with shunning. You know how my family's been treating me and how Dave's family has been treating him. Well, we've never given up in prayer, and I know that we can ask Jesus for anything in his name, and he will do it. And we have been praying very, very hard, and some of our friends have been praying. And about a month ago, my mom needed minor surgery on her knee. And um, I live across the street from her. Of course, my other sister moved away. She wanted to move away from the apostate, so she's gone. But she's still in the town. I haven't talked or seen my family. And a month ago, meanwhile, I pray every day. Dave prays, and a lot of our friends are praying. A month ago, I answered the phone. It was a week before my mother's surgery. And it was my sister on the phone the one who had not spoke to me in 15 months. And I couldn't believe it. And, I, and she said, Hi, Lori. She said, It's me. She said, I, uh, I just need to talk to you. You're the only one that I can talk to. And I just couldn't believe it. I melted. I have been talking to her for a month now. <laughs> and this is great. And I talked to her husband, and I talked to my niece, and I talked to my, um, my nephew, her, his wife all on the phone. I mean, they're acting as if nothing happened, but I'm able to show them 
that I have love for them and I hold no resentment. And my normal nature would have been to tell them off. I'm just telling you. I would have. That, that's being very honest. I, they, they know me. In fact, they know me even as a witness that if somebody did something wrong to me, I went right to them and settled it. I mean, just like the Bible said, I said, now you did this, that, and the other, and I don't like it. So they were in a state of shock, I'm sure, that when they called me, they thought they were going to probably have to hear a whole big scenario from me. They used to make jokes about me and my family that I did that. But I went ahead with my prayer that if I ever got to talk to them, I would just show them love. I know where it's going to lead. It might not be now because I want it right now. It might be even a couple of years. It took me six. So I'm never going to give up. And even for my brother and sister up in Pennsylvania who are so fanatical and think we're going to die soon, I pray for them every day because I love them and I know that they love Jehovah just like I do. They are just so blinded. They have got um, a blinders on and they don't know it. And they've, they've got a force behind them that's not what they think. And so therefore, we really have to pray that the Holy Spirit will fight against that force that is tying them down because then they can all be free. And we really have no power. But the reason I specifically brought that up is because if you had asked me two months ago, I would have been very, well, I hope I speak to them, but I'm excited. And I I make ways to talk to her. I've called her four times now under silly little excuses. (laughs) And I've run into her at my mom's house uh, several times. So there is hope. And when we're free in Jesus Christ, as, as this assembly shows us, we have to give freedom to other people to come along at their own pace and not to force them because that's the normal tendency. Just leave it in God's hands and never stop praying. And that's all. Thanks a lot.